Right. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate you uh, having me on today. I appreciate the invitation. And I hope that we uh, build a relationship uh, with you guys over here. It's uh, something that many of us in the company are often asking for. So um, I hope that this conversation opens your eyes today. Hope you have a little fun, and I'll try to be as quick as possible. Am I time limited? No. Or right, I know y'all have things to do because y'all young. I used to be young way back in the day, <laughs> back, back when the hairstyles y'all wearing now was out for the first time. But <laughs> um, um, let me get to business. So I'm Aaron Nelson. Uh, Scrum Master and Instructional Designer uh, with uh, C-Panel. Does anyone in here know what C-Panel is? Please tell me! So I once talked to one of your employees, one of your maybe workers, and she was a technical writer. Um, so you guys do like domain type thingies? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Domain, domain and thingy both come up through the day. <laughs> and I know that people work with Postgator before. Yes. <laughs> well, I think knowing about HostGator is one of the things kind of gets you to understand what cPanel is. I uh, appreciate that many people still don't know what cPanel does. They're familiar with hearing it, but describing it sometimes it's been even hard for the company to articulate, so I'll, I'll definitely cover that. So, going to it. A little bit about me. Uh, if you go to the cPanel site, I am the guy that's talking about food. Thank you. That's why I said I don't need any food. So, there's a uh, this shows the power of um, editing, and everything goes into the director's hands. I uh, we did a company video we talked about a lot of insightful things, and things we learned about working at the company, um, and what we liked about the company. All of my contributions got whittled down to I like the lunches. The lunches <laughs> so, go to the site, you'll see a rather robust me talking about the food. All right. About cPanel, cPanel is the hosting platform of choice. Uh, the web hosting's industry most reliable and Twitter control panel since 1997. Our first class support, the bridge feature set, uh, is easy to see our customers are part of make cPanel uh, at WHM, their hosting platform of choice. So, cPanel uh, 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 provides web automation software. Uh, what happens is, is it, it can be complicated to uh, run software and host, uh, to, to, to Host the website right So cPanel takes work that you would have to pay system administrators to do um, and automates it. It's built for a variety of skill levels. So you can hop in um, for a low price point and take care of basic things such as mail, databases on your site. You can also get more complex. So you can go from working through our, 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 our set of icons, you can also dive into the command line. So that's the product itself. Um, it's very visible because, like HostGator, uh, it, it accompanies many different products. Oh wow, my browser got up here. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, obviously, see, I'm going to later in this conversation, I will come back to talking about uh, cPanel jobs, but I want to just quickly give a little info on cPanel.com. We have been under cPanel.net. Um, up until about a week ago, and uh, we just redesigned our site. And we also acquired the .com domain. So, let me start down here. Company started in 97, about 200 people. To have this global reach, uh, many people uh, are, are, are shocked to find out the company has about 200 or so people with it. The uh, majority of those in Houston, with uh, many of our support uh, uh, analysts. Uh, as well as a few developers sprinkled throughout the globe. So what do we do? We aspire to make cPanel, uh, we aspire rather, to make cPanel universally synonymous with dependable hosting and server automation solutions. Is the volume on this thing? I, I think, think so. so. I think you have to look down to the little things of the room at 420. I'm just Let's give this a try. I think this little video will give you some background to what cPanel does, and then I'll hop back on to what Agile is, Scrum is, and what I do. Hi there. To begin, what's a recent common question asked by a lot of you? Why do we exist? cPanel Inc. exists for one reason, and only one reason. That's 
best to provide reliable automation software for companies to offer economic web hosting services. We exist to make web hosting accessible and easy to use to a very wide audience. They don't move around the keys easily. Come on, that does sound like big words for such a low back company. So let's break things down into a basic foundation we can all wrap our heads around. Who is our target market? Answer web hosting companies. We build our software primarily for web hosting companies and empower them to offer economic web hosting services. That's what makes us special. We have a single purpose in life, and that's to make web hosting services easy, economical, and reliable for hosting companies and website owners. Some might go as far as to say we empower the world to sell cheap web hosting. But do we stay cheap with lack of features or functionality? Because CPanel and WHM provide nothing short of a true automation experience for web hosting providers and website owners. Why is this important? More than 20% of websites rely on CPanel and WHM to provide such things as e-commerce, a company website, personal blogs, and application hosting. By making this process super efficient, 60 seconds or less, it cuts down on the costs of doing business, thus enabling people globally to have their own website for a few dollars a year. You can service and economy of base regardless of which hosting provider you choose. No one does it better than we do. We need the tool that anyone can understand and the admins respect. Everyone likes easy with low overhead. We provide you with the tools to make your lives easier and in many ways we've helped to inform the hosting industry over the years. It's important because the web hosting industry represents the future of almost every major enterprise in which humans are engaged. This is not Skynet, it's the evolution of our world society and leveling the playing field for individuals, groups, and small companies to have the same communication benefits that would generally only be available to large organizations or governments. If you were to summarize these statements into one sentence, we'd say something like this. We empower almost anyone to run a hosting company and own a website. In making the barrier of entry a simple process, we turn a once complicated process into a simple standard. We enable communication, e-commerce, business marketing, and exchange of information throughout the world via CPAM and WHM. Time travel back to 1995. <laughs> The cost of hosting a single site was fifty to one hundred dollars per month. Fast forward, and we were able an individual or business to host a website in email for less than one of those fancy frappuccinos. When people think of CPanel, we want to immediately think web hosting. In fact, we want to be synonymous with web hosting in every way. Visit us: www.cpanel.net. So, does that make sense to you guys? Any questions about that? So essentially, a, a C panel enables you to right now, today, go start your own web hosting company. Uh, you can go out there and you can create your own web hosting company that can compete with GoDaddy. Now, GoDaddy being one of our larger clients. Hostgator in town, large client, large customer base, but if you have a niche market, students, um, musicians, artists, a country that you have access to, um, whatever that market is, and you think you can provide hosting to them, you can use CPM to get you there. It's relatively cheap. And you have um, you even have points where if you choose to go to, with a larger company like a, like a GoDaddy yourself, then you can work with what's called a reseller, where you let them handle a lot of the infrastructure and handle the servers and other things like that, and you are reselling space. It's like renting an apartment to people. You know, you mom, someone else owns the apartment building, but you're the leasing agent. You put people in that apartment. So it is a low barrier to entry. Uh, it is a tool that, that gives you a, not just a chance to run your own website. It does that in manage mail and things like that, but you can even start your own business. So it's a really cool product. So let's see. Get back to my presentation here. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about Agile. This quote here removes the relay race. The relay race is in regards to waterfall. The relay race approach by the development may conflict with the goals of maximum speed and flexibility. So that's that handing off a piece of work from one team to another. 
Instead, a holistic or rugby approach, where a team tries to go the distance as a unit, passing the ball back and forth, may better serve today's competitive requirements. So if you're ever seeing a, a, a rugby match, um, um, then you'll know where the term scrum comes from. When the teams get together and hold around that ball. But uh, while scrum also comes from rugby, the work that we do, as you'll see, is often like that team moving across the field as they play rugby, they know about lateral passing. Back and forth. A person moves ahead, they're done. They pass the ball back. Now that was back in 1986. Here's a scrum definition. There's agile. Scrum is a process within agile, or a type of application of agile. Scrum is an agile process that allows us to focus on delivering the highest business value in the shortest time. It's the most we can get for the least amount of work. It allows us to rapidly and repeatedly inspect actual working software every two weeks to one month. The business sets the priorities. Teams self-organize to determine the best way to deliver the highest priority features. Every two weeks to a month, anyone can see real working software and decide to release it um, to release it as it is or continue to enhance it for another spring. So the key is working software. There is a time frame of two weeks and it's business driven. So it's value driven. But the software team, the developers, get a say as to what's achievable. Um, they don't overcommit. And we'll talk about all that. So what we have are two conflicting camps of development methodology. Uh, you probably are used to the waterfall method which is formal business requirement documents uh, where we talk about uh, what we want as a product, then you hand that off. Now the uh, designers get their hands on it, they begin using theory, they apply their design, they all agree upon the design, emails fly back and forth, documents go back and forth, then they build it. So now the developers are actually coding here. Then after it's done, tweaks, changes, um, then the entire package gets handed off to testing. This could take a year. What if something's wrong? Does anybody see what can go wrong with this particular model? Yeah, uh, something goes wrong and it needs to go back to the earlier bits. We can't. we can't because we are bound by maybe budget. You know, we, we got this, we got a year to get this done and it doesn't, it, it, there's a delay right here. What do these people do all year long? They're idle. That's time waste. They're getting paychecks. They're bored. They're not being challenged. What do they do once they hand things off? So we have the Agile method. You can compare it, and you'll see that there's this constant cycle of discovery, design, and development, and this has to testing, and then release. And if it's good enough, it could have stopped. Wow, a touch screen. <laughs> <laughs> it can stop right there. All right. Any questions over Agile? So you, do you see the benefit of Agile versus, um, or Scrum versus Design? These, each of these circles could be a two-week period. Every two weeks, there could be a product done. Now, you could take this and turn it into a six-week cycle where maybe you know, this is not a, uh, we can't bend the rules of space and time. So maybe everything can't be done in two weeks. However, what if we have fully functioning components um, or a prototype that we can get the basics and prove the concept works and now for the next two weeks we can add to that. Kind of like uh, building a chassis of a car, then put in the engine, then put the body on top of that. But we know inside that chassis, that basic framework works. Now, Agile is based upon a series of loose rules, beliefs, and so it tries to engage a very humanistic uh, aspect um, of software development. It's not just a set of rules, it's all about how you feel, what you think, how we treat each other. So they, they, in 2001, some developers got together and they wrote the Agile Manifesto. So in 86, we saw the discussion about Maybe we should uh, get away from waterfall in the relay race and move to a more rugby-like approach. Well, the Agile Manifesto came in 2001 and had a set of credos. These are things that they value. 
individuals and interactions over process and tools. And I'll touch it then. It works sometimes. I got myself in hot water. It's all good. They value working software over comprehensive documentation. All right? So does it work? Well, we can't release until we got all the documentation now. Let's, but does it work? Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So this would be not just building what we want. As a scrum master, sometimes you tell developers, guys, this is not the science fair. Meaning we you can't work and close the doors and pretend there's not a customer base out there and just build whatever we want to do. That, I know that it's cool we get to do this in sprints and not get interfered with, but we have to build business value products. Okay, so talking to your customer, we'll talk about how that gets split out versus contract negotiations. Not about next contract, it's building useful things. Finally, responding to change over following a plan. One uh, thing to kind of symbolize this is failing fast. If it's not going to work, let's find out quickly. Therefore, we can adapt. It is much less painful to find out something's not working in two two weeks sprints and find out in one month over finding out that it's not working at the end of the year. A year of work, and then you find out the product's not even relevant to the market. Another visual representation of waterfall versus agile. Um, waterfall. The scope is locked in early, and this is wide open. You have your plan written. You don't know how much time it's going to take because there's already something else you can do, which also means your costs escalate. Now you start to see this rift come between people who maybe trying to perfect the product and people who are now pushing for the relevance or the cost. What's going on? So the business people start to lean in. Here, everyone's on one accord. Time and cost are locked in. This will be inspected on a regular basis every two weeks. The scope is wide open because it's going to be developer driven. Talk about that some more. So, Scrum Awards. Back in 1993, Jeff Sutherland is uh, one of the uh, early founders of this. Ken Schwaber, Mike Beeler, you'll recognize these names if you uh, start to look into Agile. Ken Schwaber and Mike Cohn. Co-founded Scrum Alliance 2002, initially within the Agile Alliance. And this presentation, a lot of this presentation, actually comes from Mountain Gold Software. Um, so I want to actually give them credit for uh, sharing this content. Scrum's been used by a number of companies. Take a look. I'm sure you'll see some names you recognize. So Scrum is a real thing. Um, it is uh, accepted by industry leaders. Uh, although a lot of it sounds abstract, that's the reason why people such as Scrum Masters exist on the team because just like anything, it can be manipulated, but when it works well, it really does, but you need a team on the same page. You actually have to dedicate resources towards making sure that it's being managed properly because Scrum that goes the wrong way leaves a very bad taste of people. Oh yeah, it's also used by us. See, okay. <laughs> this being our, our new logo, which was just launched last week. Types of projects Scrum has been used for? Commercial software development uh, on the joint strike fighter that the Navy and the Air Force um, are using. It's going to replace all those F-15s, F-14s, things like that. Video game development, you saw uh, electronic parts up there earlier. People make mad. Uh, FDA approved life critical systems, satellite control software, Websites, mobile phones, tons of various applications. How do we use it at cPanel? We use it for feature development, so those are the parts of our product. We use it for internal systems development, everything from uh, you know building systems to how we build um, our time off system, how we take vacation days. Our marketing team, there's a whole lot of agile marketing uh, uh, coursework and group, groups out there, so our marketing team uses agile to get their marketing materials. So the, the, to deliver this website that I was showing you earlier, that redesign is all done using Scrum principles. 
uh, as I help to build a training department, I'm using Scrum. We take all the wish lists of things that people have been wanting to do, and uh, we now are able to deliver that by allowing us to focus on things. Um, we're using that to establish a training department and training content. That will be free training that we place out there for you guys who uh, want to learn um, all aspects of cPanel. Our customer service team is using Scrum to implement projects that they want to deliver. So what are some characteristics of a Scrum team? Self-organizing. How does that sound? No boss on that team. No manager on that team. Everyone is equal. Product progresses in a series of two to four week sprints. The shorter the better. One week, a little bit too short. Two weeks, give you a chance to plan, do it, make sure it works, come back together. The wish list. High in the sky is what we call uh, those requirements are captured as items in a list that's called the product backlog. Your backlog is this big old list of all the stuff you wish you could do. You're going to focus at the top and reorganize that top group, see what's important, push that out to get it done. No specific engineering practices prescribed. So there's no one way that's best. Uh, it's used generative rules to create an agile environment for delivering projects, one of the agile processes. So I want to focus up here. Self-organizing, every two weeks somebody's free to take a look at it. All right, can everything apply to Scrum? I use Scrum for projects in my family. I use it around the house. My wife. She's been converted to doing Scrum. She didn't even realize it. Uh, so we've been using Scrum to get stuff organized. But she was happy because she saw progress. Um, now, do you want to use Scrum to create a peanut butter jelly sandwich? No. So it's a lot of work to try to apply to these simple tasks. Close to certainty, close to agreement. <laughs> so you don't want to apply to stuff like that. But picture this kind of world. You don't know anything about the technology. No one agrees on, uh, on, on what the requirements are, so what to do. But that's called anarchy, people. You can't do anything. No, you can't. No, still, that's going to be a bad scrum experience with completely anarchy, uh, complete anarchy is going on. So you want to apply it to complex problems where there is the technology, you're free to use different things, that's negotiable, and the requirements are negotiable. So in other words, you're being told to be creative. Scrum fits right there. All right, so I keep talking about Scrum, then I throw out another vocabulary word, Sprint. This is what it looks like. The list of things to do are called the product backlog. Someone keeps that list, we'll talk about those roles. Then that's presented to the team in what's called a Sprint backlog. That's your to-do list. That's like when you make that list of things to do over the weekend. You have two to four weeks to finish that to-do list. Management's agreeing to give you that space. Whatever management with the business people need, you're free to give that space. And as a team, you're agreeing to deliver the work within that time. Every 24 hours or business days, because not on the weekends, we meet. At the end of those two weeks, you ship the product. Any questions right there? That I understand? Can anybody see any advantage to this process so far? Just, um, any advantage? You're constantly updated on the issues. Yes. You're, it's, it's, you're constantly updated on what's going on and shining the spotlight on it. It's going to surface rather quick. Because there's this social accountability of checking in every 24 hours. Plus, the work is confined to the team. So while the entire company may not know what's going on, the team is aware of what was agreed to. And daily, they're able to see the process. Any other advantages? Um, if a if a requirement was ever changed, you'd be able to notice that within uh, a short period of time. Yes, and in fact, we kind of even keep a, a gateway right here that once the sprint starts, we're going to make sure requirements don't change unless it's a catastrophic issue. Good points. All right, so the sprint. We go from the scrum to the sprint. Scrum projects make part of a series of sprints. Um, typically, two weeks. Here's one of those abstract things. What about Christmas? What about Thanksgiving? What about, I'm on, I'm on a vacation for a week. Can we change the... No. A constant duration leads to a better rhythm. So, we do things like, if you're going to be on vacation for two weeks, because you're going to Hawaii, you got to get your tan on, you got to chill, you got stuff to do. 
What is the whole entire team of people? At the beginning of that sprint, we're going to account for how much you deliver. You may normally give so much work in two weeks. Well, common sense. Hopefully, we talk to you. Hopefully, we know you because we work together sprint to sprint. You, you told us you're going on vacation. We don't sit and let you commit to two weeks worth of work. And at the same time, you don't sit and commit to two weeks worth of work. There's no superhero act in this. It's just um, you do what you can. But those two weeks provide this rhythm for the team to to know what's our flow. We know we meet on day one. We know by day two we start to kind of get things organized. By day three we go our separate ways. On day six and seven we start to come back together again. Day eight, you know, QA is almost done. Day nine and ten, we're just making sure it all works. We're getting ready for an actual demonstration. And you need that kind of rhythm to give people a chance to come together closely, separate, and get back together again. All right? The design, the coding, and the testing all take place in the spring. All in two weeks. And that's why one week's not enough time. All right? What does that look like? So you got requirements. That's the planning phase. Or finding out what the business wants. The design phase, theory. Then the coding phase and then testing. So let's say this were a Monday where the requirements are now laid out. Shortly thereafter, the designing begins after the team hears them. Then you'll see shortly after, the coding begins. <laughs> and then the, the dark blue line, as the first development work begins to be completed, You'll see here, at this point, now it's going, the testing phase begins. So, work is kind of, is, is happening concurrently. Imagine a bunch of building blocks. The first block gets started, designing, then coding, and then testing. Well, when this reaches testing, now the team is back working on another piece of that project. And so you kind of have this rainbow where you see the design part's over, the last thing to do is testing, share back any results, and you know, finish up any, any errors that we, that we discovered. All right, this is very developer-centric. Scrum is designed to make developers happy because a trade-off is a happy developer will give you what you want. They will have a chance to show off their creativity. Um, and uh, they don't have to worry about changes coming in. So, no changes during the sprint if you can help it. And so, by coming up for air every two weeks, that also gives the business a reassurance that they can inject some feedback. All right? They wouldn't tell you to go work by yourself and no work for a year, but I can do it. Sure, you can. No, just how about every two weeks? So, let's talk about, we talk about what a sprint looks like. Who was on the Scrum team? What do I do? What did I, what, what did I, what was my role? Scrum team has three distinct roles. The product owner, the Scrum master, and the develop, development team. Now, I repeat, I, uh, Agile or Scrum is a very developer-centric methodology. Um, and so we'll see that they make up the majority of people on the team, uh, but each role is very important. Ceremonies, we talked about the beginning of the sprint, which is the sprint planning meeting. At the end, we have a demo, a demonstration or a demo called a sprint review. This is when you can show the entire world or your company or if anyone who cares, you know, uh, what you've developed. The sprint retrospective is now the team talking to one another, and every day you meet daily scrum meetings. Artifacts. So what do we keep track of? There's a product backlog of all the things we want to do or are currently working on. The sprint backlog, which is that little piece, that tip of the iceberg that we agree to work on and deliver, and burn down charts to their internal way of measuring how the team does. All right, roles on the scrum team. Product owner, scrum master, and team. The product owner. This is probably the closest thing to what looks like a manager. Notice it is not the term project manager. Not what it is. This is the product owner. They define the features of the product. So this is the person who speaks to other business teams, to customers. They do polling. They do interviews. They're um, 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 in, 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 in on the chats. Uh, they're out there traveling the globe. 
talking about our product, learning what they can. They're also talking to people internally, all the stakeholders, to see what are we looking to build, why, what has the most value. They decide on the release date and content. They are responsible for the profitability of the product, or as much as they're allowed to be responsible for it. Uh, they prioritize features according to market value. They adjust features and priority after every iteration is needed. And they accept or reject work results. Keys here, they ask for the work, and they decide if this is what they ask for. So the team presents it to them. However, that's because they have they got some pressure on them. They are responsible. You can just scratch all this out and say the success of the product. Because they're the voice who heard what was wanted. They're the voice that asked the team, I say tell the team, ask the team to build it and whatever requirements are involved. So they have to have that balance of business acumen as well as technical acumen. They're not in charge of the developers. If you go to a scrum, a scrum environment where the product owner is telling you his team, his or her team, and I'm in charge, run. It's not how it works. But the pressure is there because the product owners also have now another nickname. That, that nickname is the single ringable neck. If this all goes down in flames, you just serve them up. Get them, throw them at the gates. The crowd will eat them alive. Everybody else just said, the product owner told me to do this. Don't do that. But the single ringable neck. Then you have the Scrum Master. That's what I do. That represents management to the project. Responsible for enacting Scrum values and practices. All these things I've been talking about. Two weeks here, and ceremonies. Removes impediments. That's a broad term. That could be getting sysadmin to provide proper testing environments. That we need. Something that the company may not even own. We need to buy that, acquire it. How much does it cost? What are the purchasing channels? Um, this could be the desk that we're meeting at. It's too low or too high. This room is too hot or too cold. Um, this could be conflicts within the team. Ensure that the team is fully functional and productive. So your team knows the coach. You're the, you're the psychologist, you're the motivator, you're the comforter. Enable close cooperation across all roles and functions. Sometimes you teach people how to argue and also how to communicate. You also shield the team from external interferences. So when you get one person on the team and you're a nice guy, what's your name? Richard. Richard, so Richard comes and says, hey guys, we're going along with my boss. So my boss asked me to work on this extra project here. Um, it's just not going to take up too much of my time. Once I hear that, that's when I would go speak to your manager and ask them to like do that. And, and not, I can't tell them not to do anything. I can't cut it off. But I can talk about the pressures that it exerts and how uh, impeding your progress on the Scrum project can ultimately impact the project itself, which is not what we do. So if you watch a lot of uh, Godfather movies or things, the mafia movies, it's like uh, I'd be like the uh, consigliere, you know, the, the, the go-between. Let me make you an offer you can't do. We can do this the easy way of uh, <laughs> Then there's a team, five to nine people. Ideally, uh, you want enough people to argue with each other. Enough people to argue, but keep on going. See, if it's only two people, and they get into it, we're stuck. If it's, if, if it's too many people, there's too many chefs in the kitchen. But you need a good balance of uh, five or nine people. Hopefully they have eyeballs and faces. It's always nice. But um, hopefully they can be cross-functional as individuals. If they are not, that's okay. Because at C-Panel, we have people that are not cross-functional as individuals, but our teams are, are cross-functional because they contain programmers, testers, UI designers, so you got your back-end developers and your front-end developers, as well as testers, even document writers on the team. So they can create it, front-end and back-end. They can test it, they can fix it when stuff's broken, and they can write the instruction manual. Put out that piece of the product. Members are full-time. That's why it's so important to say, you know, you can't, you can't split. Um, there may be some exceptions. There may be some people who visit for a little while. Teams are self-organizing, everyone's equal. And if you are a manager 
when you are not, when you walk out this room, when you're in this team working on team stuff, you are a co-worker. And membership should only change between sprints without pulling people off to go to sprints. Rhythm, timing, a consistent two-week period, getting to know each other because the team will actually begin to flow as you organically start to meld together. Like I said, it's very abstract, but it works. So what's the Scrum Master? I'm not a cat herder. It is like herding cats. Five to nine individually independent, strong-minded people with distinct personalities um, who all really want to get back to their home office and do whatever it is they want to do. And you're trying to steer them in one direction, including the product owner. It's like herding cats. Another way to look at it, it <laughs> checks in bottom, bottom, bottom. But um, it's looking at the federal government. Three branches. Don't let the height of that one confuse you. I mean, I, I, I did write it. You know, so. <laughs> anyway, so you have the executive. It's the individual. It can be viewed as the head because it's the representative to the company, to everybody else. That's the product owner. But they don't make all the rules. In America, the president's not making all the rules. Then you have the House and the Senate. So our Congress, or the legislative branch. That's our dev team. That's the most people in numbers. And they're that kind of balance. You know, they can come up with something, but that one executive can veto it. On the other hand, the product owner can come with something, and Congress is like, no, uh, no, 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 no. We, we talk about that. When these two groups aren't working together, though, the Scrum Master is there like the Supreme Court to bring balance, to interpret the rules, whether it be the Constitution, or whether it be the Agile Manifesto, or the basic rules of Scrum. I'm there to find a solution between the two. Also talk about what's the core meaning of what we're trying to do, get us all back on track. All right, ceremonies. We call them ceremonies, these are events, these are things you put on your calendar if you're on a Scrum team. Um, you'll be shocked because they, act, they don't take up too much place on your calendar, because the rest of the time, you're free to work in your own environment, as comfortably as you can. So, <clears throat> sprint planning meeting, that's a team capacity. That could be uh, how many people are going to be at work, uh, how often. For example, are you going to work here for a full two weeks, or are you taking off a week? Are you taking off any half days? Um, how many people do we have? That sort of information. The product backlog. That's the list. Think of a big to-do list. And the backlog is what we're going to shuffle it up, make sure the most important with the balance of easy things versus some that are longer and harder. Um, we're going to move those up to the top, and then we're going to see how much that we can do, and that's our sprint goal. Then we have a sprint planning meeting. In this meeting, we also talk about how to achieve the sprint. We create a sprint backlog, so that's the task that we do to achieve these particular backlog items uh, that we call user stories. And we estimate um, sprint backlog and hours. Now, every team doesn't do that. Um, essentially, we take a look at that to-do list, and we put arbitrary sizes on them, um, Fibonacci numbers. Uh, so basically, say, it's, or you can look at it like small, large, extra large. And we starts to learn how long it takes to do a small project versus a large feature. All right, so let's give an example. The team, the product owner comes with their list of stuff to do. Guys, here are the things at the top of my list that I've got to sign off in agreement from the business and my stakeholders that this is what's most important. So now I'm going to offer this up to you. Let's talk about it. And just like with your arms folded, you're like, okay, let's see what you got. Let's see. <laughs> Team selects items from the backlog they can commit to complete. I try to create this healthy tension where the product owner is sort of aggressive but respectful. The team is empowered to challenge the product owner. You didn't give me enough, or you're unrealistic. You're completely unrealistic. The sprint backlog gets created. Tasks are identified, each is estimated. Like I said, we don't use hours because we don't want to lock you in like that. We use these relative sizes. 
collaboratively, collaboratively, not done alone by the Scrum Master. High level design is considered. So this is not a this meeting that takes place is not a a, a, a coding meeting. It's what we call a hack session. In fact, we tell you sometimes close your laptops. Don't come in with the laptop. Let's have this meeting and talk about things. Um, we also talk about it in turn with a broad stroke. Not saying what systems are involved, if we can help it, but more of what the end user wants. So this is called a user story. As a vacation planner, I want to see photos of the hotels. How can you give that to me? You start talking. Well, we could use what we need to do. We need to code the UI to see what it looks like from the end user's point of view. We'll need to uh, code the back end. Okay, how long will that take? Let's talk about it. We need to do some testing. Okay, and um, we need to update some of those tests. So you start talking about pieces that go into it. Or you say, well, maybe I'll, I'll look at a couple different coding languages or platforms. Well, up, other variables you have there. But as a dev team, I'm asking, but you're all saying what components go into place. Or, or you may be asking for clarification. You just don't take it to the face value. Then you have the daily scrum. How many of you heard the story of uh, ham and eggs? Have heard the ham and eggs story? <laughs> Not that one. Well, with ham and eggs, what and eggs? What two animals do you need? You need a pig and a chicken. So the pig and chicken get together and make those ham and eggs. Well, the chicken, the chicken is involved. The ham or the pig is committed. <laughs> so the people on the scrum team, you're the pigs. You're the ham. You're committed. The chicken, those are your stakeholders. It's nice to hear what they have to say. They can come by and visit your daily scrum. They can watch. They can you know, ask you what's going on. You can even have public uh, lists uh, uh, of the different tasks that you're doing. You can show your burn down chart to show we started with this much work and every day over 10 days we brought it down to this much work. But they're the chicks. Here's the meeting. It's called Daily Scrum. It takes place in a room just like this. It looks a lot like this. In fact, so we got four over here, three over here, one right there. So this is You'd be my, my lawyer hanging out. I'd be like, come on, come on, let's see, come on, talk to us. But we would have uh, maybe eight, anywhere from five to nine of us in a room. And we meet for 15 minutes. And we talk about some very specific things. Then we play around each other. Um, this is not, it's a stand up meet, it's 15 minutes, literally. So that means a timer gets turned on if you're having problems with that. Otherwise, it's kind of loosey goosey, but no more than 15 minutes. You want to create that sense of urgency. To create that, you often ask your team to stand up. So this means also called the stand up. Because if you're sitting down, you do that. She's sitting like that now, start talking all day. You're like, what's going on? Well, you know, lunch is, lunch is late, and then on top of that, you know, my office is cold. And it's, we didn't want to leave the meeting. We were trying to get out of here. So we stand up. This is not a coding, problem solving meeting. You can tell us about the problem. You can tell us who needs, who you want to help you with the problem. Someone else can also say, I will come and help you after this meeting. The whole world is invited. The chickens, the pigs are talking. Only team members, the scrum master, the product owner can talk. This helps to avoid unnecessary meetings. And no one, I know developers say just them, but no one likes to put unnecessary meetings. So this brings problems to the surface every single day, as you mentioned, and now we can break off into groups. We all hear about it. Who needs to fix it? Why is one of my UI developers to fix it? So that we, these three folks right here. Everyone else is free to go about it like, I don't have to worry about that meeting at 1 o'clock. That's them. I hope they get it straight. See them tomorrow. That, in the middle of your sprint, that could be the only involvement you have with your team that day. In that meeting, you answer three questions. So nine people, or eight people, or seven people, answering three questions. What did you do yesterday? 
Not, I went to the store and there was a lot of juice. So I was mad because I really like juice. So then I had to get some water. And I drink water, but I don't like the way water tastes. Not that. <laughs> this is, what did you do specifically on our task board? What component of the story or project did you work on? So that's, I, I like to use this card as an example. What will you do today? I'm still working on this right here. Okay, that might be fine for day one. Day three comes, what are you doing? I'm still working on this right here. <laughs> now that's what starts to happen. You've been working on that for three days. And now that's going to be in a conversation. Is anything in your way? So it's not like you get to joke, oh, I'm still working on that. Is anything in your way? We're going to ask that question to you. You can either bring it up, but it is expected that you answer that. This is not the Scrum Master. So, we talk about agendas. This is not for the product owner to walk around and ask people, hey, what did you do yesterday? If I catch a product owner doing that, I slap them on the hand, tell them to sit down. I grab them. I don't really grab them. Well, one time I did with that, but they talk. <laughs> <laughs> you don't let the, the product owner grab the lead role or the rein. This is also not for the Scrum Master. You're not answering these because Scrum Master made you. In fact, the Scrum Master will tell you, don't look at me when, when you tell me this or mention this. Tell your team. You know, it's not, oh, Aaron, I didn't do it again. No, it's, you look at your coworker, you're like, no, I'm not supposed to give you that, 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 that piece of the front end. No, I still don't have it ready. It's that sort of thing. It's in front of your peers. Then, if everything went well, you accomplished most of what you wanted to, so at the end of two weeks, you do the sprint review. Typically, it takes the form of a demo of the new feature. It's showing how it works in production that has been tested or that is ready to go to production. Very informal. You can have a very light agenda. Not a two-hour meeting. We're talking about a two-hour prep. This is so you don't. You just you got ten days to develop. The very first day we're meeting and putting together the plan. So you only have about nine days to develop. We don't want to take an extra day away from you planning a meeting. So about two hours, and we're very big on that. You know, you keep developing as much as possible. We're not worried because every day we talked about the status of this information. And <laughs> you'll even see here things like no slides. Now, some people like to add some, some formality just to kind of steer a conversation. So there's some flexibility on that. Here are the key points, though. The whole team participates. And you can invite the entire company to see what was built. I can guarantee you that most people in the company don't want to come see what you do. But the invitation is there. So your key stakeholders will be there. Now, after your demo, it either worked or you told your audience, we tried to build it, we only got this far, here are the issues that we found, give us feedback. Then you thank everybody and leave the room. Now we're stuck looking at each other. We just worked together for two weeks. We tried to build something. We were either successful, kind of successful, maybe not very successful. Let's take a look at what is and what is not working. I advise y'all to do this in your personal relationships. Have a retrospect. Just sit down. Like, girl, girl, you happy? <laughs> just talk about what's going on. Because if you don't ask, you might not get an answer. So this is going to keep your team healthy. Keep your relationship healthy. That's a little advice I give you. Typically, every, this last 15 to 30 minutes, these, this is, as, a, as a scrum master, this can be the most entertaining part of the sprint because this is where the fights happen. This is where people come and, you know, we could have gotten more done, but Richard was tired. <laughs> And doors are closed, and we're on there together, and we talk about what happened. Or, or we congratulate each other. I was stuck, and you came, and you helped me. But uh, the entire team participates, um, and we, we, we challenge ourselves to come out with what we did well, as well as not, what is not working. We do things like SWOT analysis, um, various other activities to look at the performance. Um, we have a burned out chart, we see what we completed. Um, we also do things like uh, what, what can we start doing, what can we take away, what can we continue, uh, other exercises. We can get very specific or very general. We can talk about personality conflicts. We can talk about broken processes. Are we, are we handing things off and developing to QA the right way? Is there a way to get QA involved earlier 
Should we do some peer programming? Is peer programming throwing things up? Do we need a better code review? All these things can come back in this retrospective. The thing is, think of when you turn a cruise ship. You know, cruise ships can't make sharp turns. They have to gradually tack into the turn. That's what we're doing here. We get together after two weeks, talking about how it worked, moving on. All right, stop, start, continues what I just mentioned. If you can walk out with these things, I don't care how you get there, you want that conversation to end with what should we start doing that we haven't? What should we stop doing that's slowing down productivity? Is there anything we should continue doing? Finally, artifacts. There's the product backlog. That's your big to-do list. And that is the product owner's paper. They collect all the lists. If someone stops you in the hallway and says, hey, y'all should build one of those, tell the product owner. Or you can take that information. You get an idea. You can't squeeze into the sprint Tell the product owner. They're going to manage that list. What we do is take a look at that backlog, and the team actually votes through card, we call it planning poker, but they assign relative sizes. These are roughly doubles, so you have one, which makes the smallest task. It's about twice as much work as a one, let's make it a three. Okay, that's more work than a three, let's make it a five. Uh, it's going to be more work, let's make it an eight. So you have these relative numbers um, that are not quite duplicates, but they are roughly, you know the work is bigger than, is more than what that five is. Fibonacci numbers. Sprint goals is a short statement of what the goal should be. Managing the backlog. This is where that freedom comes in. Self-managing. You choose your own work. Product owners do not tell you what you're going to do. Now, if you're UI, you take on a UI task. What if you want to get to some of the back end and learn some more? You can partner with the back end dev. Estimated work remaining is updated daily. So that's how we know we had 30 story points on Monday. After we talk after the daily scrum and after work is delivered or updated in our one of our management systems, we know we have 27 points on Tuesday. Any team member can add, delete, or change the sprint backlog, but you do it in front of the team. Work for the sprint emergence. Sort of like you can't plan everything in advance. Um, you have these relative sizes, pretty much a big guess, and you try to work within. If work is unclear, the final sprint backlog item with a larger amount of time and break it down later. So we're all about breaking down the work. Basically, you have each piece of work, you break it down into tasks, and as the week progresses, new work pops up as well as other components that might already be done. What's really important to know is what we call the burn down chart. It can be hours, it can be story points, it can be small, large, extra large. Normally we do story points. What you're going to end up with is some total. This, you can take the zeros off, this could be 100, 80, 60. You can take off these numbers, and it could be 10, 8, 6, and 2, 4. But basically, you want to see a certain amount of work agreed to, Maybe some new work that was necessary had to be added, and as you complete the work over two weeks, you want to see that chart going down somewhat. The world's not perfect. Some work takes multiple days, so you're not going to see a steady drop every day, but a gradual drop over time. Don't worry about this. Scalability. Simply, this means that you really don't want to have a team um, um, get too large. A typical team is about seven people, plus or minus two. You need enough to cover all the different roles to completely deliver something, uh, but not too big where it's unmanageable, where people are bored, where work labor is being wasted because they're not engaging. All right. Then you have what's called the Scrum Scrums. These are various Scrum teams who are a representative of each Scrum team is coming to one meeting to talk to make sure that other people aren't being kept in the dark, to make sure that you're not working on a piece of the software that they're working on. Because now you could have, if you're creating code from scratch to fix a problem, how do we know that your work's going to integrate together? So we, need, we don't need everybody in the room. We need representatives from each team to get together and talk about it. And that happens once a week. So, so far, I've taken up two hours of planning, 15 minutes a day over the remaining eight days, and then two more hours over the last day. This is all about if you have a really large company, 
you have reps from these four teams, reps from these three teams. They need to all communicate about their, what they're working on and share that information. Um, and I think that is it. Uh, if you have any any questions, you are about Scrum um, that we don't answer right now. You can definitely look me up on LinkedIn. I'll see you in this link, but I'm just under Aaron Nelson, Aaron Nelson Jr. on uh, LinkedIn. My work address is aaron.nelson.cpanel.net. Uh, I encourage you to go to cpanel.com, jobs.cpanel.com, and universe.cpanel.net. Um, Jobs.cpanel.com will take you to our site where you can see me talking about food, <laughs> and you also see our perks. Care lunch every day. Flexible work schedule. We get people coming at 6 in the morning. We get people coming at 10. Tuition reimbursement. Health and vision insurance. Free iPhones and Galaxies. Um, 401k with generous matching. Company wide events. In fact, tonight I believe uh, one of the teams is meeting, um, I think, at David Buster's. And pay time off. As far as coding languages go, um, uh, C panel is written in Perl. So if you are a Perl developer like to learn Perl, uh, it's potentially a place for you. Um, we uh, 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 have a world of Linux specialists. So our technical analysts, our Linux analysts, uh, are there. I encourage you to either uh, learn C panel to the best of your ability if you're interested in working as a technical analyst. UI developers, there are a plethora of them, they're very talented. And we have tons of other open positions, which are all listed here. You'll see roles such as product owners, part scrum teams, QA analysts do the testing, working on a scrum team, um, DevOps working internally, the customer service, which is just the basic sales and servicing of our licenses and our product, um, admin roles, network engineers, a ton of roles for a company that at this point still has about 200 people or so. Here are various departments, development or developers, as you guys are all studying to be. Our design teams, uh, who create craft and look, our documentation, our technical writer teams, our marketing and sales. Our product is very big about uh, taking care of our customers. Our company rather, QA, tech support, uh, human resources or ESD, and our sys admins, who uh, make everything work. Casual every single day. The suit, standard issue headphones, really nice. Free cookies, more food. Um, quirkiness is okay. I cannot tell you how different C panel is. Um, just an example, this is me uh, in New Orleans a couple of years ago at one of our annual C panel conferences. Uh, every year we host a conference. Uh, every other year we do it in Houston. However, uh, on those other years, we go to places like Austin, New Orleans. Uh, this year we're headed to Denver for the C panel conference. So um, people who create more who are integrators, who um, have products they want to inter integrate into our product, as well as uh, people who look just like you who own web hosting companies from around the globe. Uh, travel to our conference to share best practices, to network, to learn, because there is enough business in this industry to go around. Um, so it's a very friendly environment. Uh, we have stormtroopers, more food, no steam here. <laughs> Tons of food. This is lunch like every day. Uh, of course, we keep fridges, stop the curates and uh, sodas. And there's there. I heard there's fruit in the building. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, free snack machines, all that sort of thing. So I'll stop right there. I think I've talked long enough. Um, but do you have any questions about Scrum and Agile? Any questions about CPanel and working for a software? What do y'all think?
So what else? So what what um what do you guys say? Or what are your what are your projections on, on where you want to work, what it what you want to do? Um just curious. I think most of us are CS. Yeah, most of us are being as the skills that can apply to any industry. Are are you attracted to any particular industries at the moment? Um for example, web hosting is one where there really is a divide. We have our technical analyst people who are Linux specialists and web hosting itself. They're totally separate from our our CS guys, our developers, who simply, you know, they build the product. They they have to learn from the product owner how customers use it. But if we started selling, I don't know, widgets tomorrow or sneakers or something else, those those guys, the developers, who still they would just go on to develop whatever was needed, you know, for that production. So, is there any industries you guys are interested in? Or? Uh, if not, uh, software and say gas and oil. Gas and oil. Okay. Do it all. Uh, do it all. Yes. Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, what is? Uh, what would be like? Uh, not a procedure, but like uh, how would it work for a new uh, new member of the in the team's company? What do you hire? How is the, the approach? Because you enter in the new. Yes. Um, the um, 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 we, 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 uh, the tr the, you saw there was a, the goal to have teams at plus or minus um, seven people. Seven people plus or minus two. So anywhere from nine to five people. Uh, you look at a team and you see where there is an opportunity. Um, the, and, and if that team is taking on a particularly large project, over the next uh, uh, four months, then that might be a team to add the developer. Um, also, if you're a new developer, um, new to the company or new to the skill, there's a difference. If you're new to the company, you have a product, maybe we can put you as a second developer on the team. If you are a young developer moving up the ranks, then it might be good to have a senior developer work with you, where we aren't counted as three full developers yet, we're more or less so it, you can it, 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 you definitely account for that um, because you're looking at that senior that potentially serving as a mentor, and as part part of being a senior that is taking that sort of mentor role with, with uh, part of the part to earn the title. So you will be one. And as a scrum master, you, the scrum master will help to get you up to speed and go up with the team and make sure you're the board. Yes. I'm the not this person. What am I expecting to do? See, that was very unique, very patient. So, um, I, the, the biggest skills you probably bring is what is flexibility. We have people that come from the first, in the background. There are people who are self taught, there are people who have formal uh, uh, education to that level. People worked in oil and gas, worked in NASA, uh, people who, you know, just sort of proved their skills. Uh, there's a guy who wanted to work at CPAL and he um, created a video on YouTube. He's a UI developer, he's a designer, and director. He used all his multimedia skills to talk about him wanting to work at CPAL. He got him on the map. He got him to the interview, and um, during the interview, they'll have you solve some problems to show your aptitude. Um, but, but other than that, it, it's, I would say, being different, have a different perspective than actually. Another question. We'll talk to, I know there's tools like Jira that you can use for like campaign boards and things like that. That's what, that, that's what we use. That's what we use. That's what we use. Uh, um, we used to use a tool called Target Process to manage, <laughs> um, to manage our scrum processes. Uh, but with that last and suite of products, uh, Jira. Um, then that, that's our current platform. I'll say Jira is pretty popular. It's, it's, it's very flexible. You can do things like manage a scrum project, and you can manage other types of projects. It's able to take you as far as you can have a lot. I see him sign up. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying.
is anything about the scrum process scary as far as visibility? When I say it's open, it is open. Those um, the burned out the progress charts, those burned down charts, are posted in all ways and rooms people have seen. Um, uh, information available online for anything to inspect. However, there's one not a critical eye. It really is all for collaboration. Um, it's just trying to get you, you really want it to get possible to see what you're working on. It's talking about. Because if it goes ignored, you know, you pay for each customer and you never work with them. Does it sound too lax? Is there a fear there? Does it sound too like come on, I can't do it. <laughs> We're not gonna stay in my office all day. So then you do have to make sure you have another work environment. You do see what people need to do. If you don't have enough, if we're not a project that doesn't have a real UI component, you have to really sit down with the team and assess is the UI work going to increase for this particular project. If not, can we find another place for our young people? Because you don't want a person who's checking out on the team. If you have too many developers, you know, you, as a scrum master, you're going to talk to the developer and see how you really I all three of them really feel. You know, there's someone on the board, maybe there's someone in over the water, in over the head, we need help. So um, as a Scrum Master, those sorts of issues can be in the room. Devs can meet every single day and I talk about them. Scrum Master has to throw about those, those types of uh, more personal issues. Now, what about your manager? Your manager doesn't see what you do every day. Who what you're doing. So for a manager, um, that's where the other aspect of managing skills I've been to. It's a combination of talking to you as an employee, talking to the scrum master, talking to the product owner, and also seeing the caliber of the work during those demonstrations. So the manager is not this extra person poking in. It's just they're the stakeholder, but um, they may happen to share the same, you know, same skill set. Right, how about working at a software company? Big company, little company. You guys got any questions there? The closing concept both. Before I work at the CPM, I came from JP Morgan Chase. That's been about 11 years. So I've had a chance to work for one of the world's largest companies, and I've also had a chance to work for a very small company where the things I work on are in production in a few months. And we have to work on so it's a pros and cons for both. Um, scrum process, you know, good personalities here are, are, are very essential. It's good to have ambition. Um, I, I talk to dads and like, people come in, they want to move up, move around. Why can't this come do their job? I mean, you feel, but it's really okay to want to move into management for the kind of product. I had a quick question with uh, regards to Scrum. Like how, how are emergencies handled? So, like, uh, for example, a crash that brings down the whole system, is that trade -offs. separate? Trade-offs. A couple things that I've got to you. Uh, one is a trade-off. An agreement to to do one thing means that we can't do something else. Scrum is not just about getting the work done. One thing that's also about is sustainability. So, one well, of the first things you tell a Scrum team is, we're not trying to hear all the hero stuff. All the, I was up all last night working till the chickens came and started crowing in the morning. And I, I was super developer. If there's an emergency, you definitely wouldn't mind you want to bug me in. That in itself would be thing. If you're doing that, sprint after sprint, and work can get accomplished, um, then we, we can't, I can't, if you leave, I can't expect that team to maintain that. Um, chances are, you're going to do that. I'm going to talk to you about your real rationale for going above and beyond. So, not working hard, but working like this, I'm trying to do people, what you're trying to prove, let's find a way to do to communicate that. Now, that, that that's one area. Um, emergencies. If we have to drop, and sometimes teams do, then we recalibrate what's going to be delivered by the team. So that means that well, if work that has not been started but barely started may return to the backlog. But now we're taking off that agreement because we now know that we're going to have to work on this emergency until it's resolved. That's a very little thing. Then there's a piece of what's called uh, technical debt. It's done, you release it. Maybe a bug doesn't get uncovered until after it's in production. Now that cycles back to your team. Um, when does that work get accomplished? 
What if you got halfway? Let's call it technical. It's all called technical debt. And so we negotiate how that, how that works. Um, yeah, Emergencies do happen, but once again, you're not, you're not being asked to play something that actually very realistic. We take that into account in retrospective. We project it to do 50 story points, only got 35 done. What happened? Emergency. Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. That's why we didn't finish. Next time, let's try 50 again and see if we can hit that. It's really not a whole set. It's really not a whole lot of uh, interaction, but it's enough to keep you from to keep you engaged. Um, and see, kind of people all have individual offices. I told you about the dogs. The dog. um, headphones. Some people have Christmas lights in their office. Other people like it completely dark. Um, let's see. Decorate how you want. Um, you come in early, you come in late. We have some people, uh, like I said, working late at night. Some people come to work and they just kind of study or they're there. Because when they go home at night, that's when they're going to get all their development work done, which is fine. I'm okay with you doing that. Because you know? when you're at work, you ain't going to So, um, <laughs> I think one got to but, but that's cool because he goes home. Yes, but, um, so uh, uh, it's it's you're, you're giving total flexibility to be you as long as it goes. And that daily check in is that's what we're trying to do. So it's it's trust and respect. It's like you're free to get it done how you want to, um, but every day you'd like to see some progress. Um, compared to what, what the university teaches in software engineering, mm -hmm. I think that Scrum, the Scrum model, gets used more often than processes that you can process in the waterfall mm -hmm. where there's a lot of documentation versus like Scrum, where there's less documentation mm -hmm. and, and involves more transparency, but people have to become more open about what they do. And basically, the, the project itself is Stakeholders, who's involved? It, it uncovers issues fast. You bring yeah. up a lot of good points. And that um, um, it, it does not hide behind process. Uh, it, it it is good to have some formal discipline in areas so that I've seen Scrum situations where people try to go you know, and that becomes scary. That's where Scrum Master steps in. It's a trade off. trade off because you may see people squirm in their seats because a product where they may be proposing. To do something with no documentation whatsoever, um, not even a drawing on a napkin, <laughs> and, 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 and because the, because the what will always get thrown your way is this is magic. We, can, <laughs> we, don't, we don't need paperwork. We don't need anything. We just want to talk off our mind. And when you bring up issues like scope creep, since no one knows what this looks like, every day when you start talking about it, it's different. So let's do things to pin this down. Uh, what's this user story look like? Um, one of the early trade-offs is uh, when you, you you can take some of the skills from having a, a, a design document, uh, just put it on paper, um, diagrams, anything else helps, proof concepts, and we have what's called acceptance criteria. That's the product owner says, I'd like for y'all to build this. And the team asks questions. And part of the acceptance criteria is um, a simple list. It's a few bullet points of what are the specific things that the product owner wants to see. That's going to be what's checked off at the end of the um, sprint. So the, the product owner's not telling you how to build it, how to get there. They're just saying as long as it has these three components, I'm happy. And that's a protection for the team because the product owner very well may come back and say four days later, you know what? I thought, you know, I want to build something. I want to have a fourth requirement. No. Um, you negotiate. You don't always put that roadblock, but you want to try to negotiate and have everything from a polite no to, well, we're done with that anyway. Let's see what we can do. Let's see if it's not going to disrupt what we need to do. So it, 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 the communication piece is big. And I even mentioned as we started that 
taking a psychology course or understanding some, some psychology of people, Toastmasters or any public speaking class, uh, learning how to communicate, learning how to say things within a time box, learning how to listen. Yeah, it's also, I think, more of a, you guys are very demanding when y'all into the workforce. Y'all are comfortable, no dress code, feed me. I need, I don't want to come in too early. I don't want to stay too late. And I've got these balance issues and all this. And so this goes along with creating a very empowering work environment. And um, also one that uh, it really makes it a nice place to work. All right, let's give our speaker a round of applause.